Okay, so let's start. I don't know. This uh, Jared, is is this working? The sound also? No. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so you will have to look smart and smile because we are being filmed. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so uh, this is a supersymmetry and extra dimensions, which is a 24 hours uh, lecture course. So that means that um, we'll have four example sheets. The example sheet, uh, the uh, supervisor for the example sheets is uh, Joe Conlon. Who is in the uh, outstanding supervisor, so you will have a lot of fun with him. So uh, what else can I tell you about this course is uh, I, I distribute a piece of paper for everybody about uh, the different topics we will discuss. <coughs> I will not write them here, just so you got different chapters. It's eight chapters. Uh, there are some sections which are marked with a star. And those sections mean that I, I will try to cover them, but not in much detail, just to give you an idea of what it is. Because uh, you will see the subject is extremely uh, big, so there are many things to be said, and uh, it will be impossible so, to give all the details about supergravity, for instance, which is, requires a lot of uh, time. So, but I will try to give you the, the, the highlights or the important things that we have to, to know. Um, <clears throat> and usually this course is... Uh, say three quarters of supersymmetry and one quarter of extra dimension. Probably I will move it more to the extra dimensions this year. So I will have more balance. And you will see the reason because supersymmetry needs more formalism. Uh, what else? Um, about uh, books and review articles. There is actually, I don't think there is a book that matches what I'm going to lecture. Uh, for different reasons. Uh, the standard reference is Wes and Bagger. Wes and Bagger is a uh, supersymmetry and supergravity, but you will see that book is, uh, is uh, very dry in the sense it has no physical motivations, it's just formalism. But it's, uh, at least you can trust all the equations that are right, and it's, 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 a, it's a good book. Uh, and then the other one that I would like to highlight is the Weinberg Volume 3, which is Quantum Theory of Fields Volume 3. By now, I, I guess you know volume one and two, so there's no problem. And uh, so, <laughs> okay, I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think it's, it's a very good book, the volume three of Weinberg, but I think it's a bit high, uh, the level is a bit high. So what I will try to do is just to digest things for you that I can extract from that book without you having to suffer through the, uh, formalism that he, 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 he needs. So you, don't need, you, you can use that as a material that you can uh, read once in a while, but not as a real textbook. Uh, but it's good to have. I mean, it's, uh, all the physical, the difficult questions about supersymmetry are addressed in that book. So that is, if you have deep questions, that's the book to ask. And I'll try to, to transmit them to you. So I, will, uh, I will use some of uh, my arguments from that uh, book also, but uh, in a less uh, sophisticated manner. It's mostly because we don't have that much time, and he requires sometimes some background that you still don't, are not supposed to have. Now there are review articles, and review articles there are plenty. Uh, <clears throat> probably the most complete one is, is the Sonius, because it's, it's a physics report, but it's already a little bit old, it's 20 years old. The one more cited for phenomenological purposes is the one by Niles, number two. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's also old. Uh, so, there I, I would like some. I like some of the ones that I mentioned uh, next: Lincoln, Martin, and Bilal. The nice thing about those three is that they are available online, so you don't have to buy anything. Just click uh, and look for uh, in HEPTH. Uh, so, uh, and they are all useful. So, so that, that's that's a good thing to have. On Kaluza Klein and extra dimensions, uh, again the review of uh, Dov et al is a bit old, but it's useful to have. Um, uh, I have uh, this Rubakov and Shaki lectures are online, so it's something that you can also consult. So <coughs> that's all the material, but of course, none of them matches what I'm going to, to lecture. So it's, 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 uh, I'll try to, to refer to some of, of this if, if I, I consider appropriate. 
um, and try to, to be as coherent as possible. OK, so, so the first chapter I will, I will start today is uh, physical motivations of supersymmetry. So, Before I start, is, uh, are there any questions, any comments, things that you would like to know about the course? No? Everything is clear. Good. Please ask me as many questions as you can. This is, I would like to have as much participation as possible because that makes the course more interesting. Uh, and I can see also how, what are the kind of things you don't understand. So please ask as many questions. I don't think there is anything as a stupid question. All the questions are valid. So don't feel shy about asking questions. I don't guarantee good answers, but I will try. <laughs> OK. So physical motivations. So let me start with uh, one simple question. OK. So it's what do we know so far? So this is a. Uh, um, so the whole lecture today will be about motivation, so some of the material I will mention, you will know it. Uh, so you know it, just use the lecture as to get used to my accent. <coughs> so okay, so what do we know so far? Uh, we know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking regarding fundamental physics or high energy physics, uh, we have first basic theories. We know which ones they are. This is quantum mechanics. And special relativity. We use that as a, our basic theories to describe the, the, the microphysics. And we know that putting the, both together, that will give us quantum field theory. And that's uh, something that you have been learning in the last uh, few months. So this is our basic theory that we are, we use to understand what is the, 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 the microscopic, the fundamental uh, issues about uh, matter in nature. And in quantum field theory, Important thing about quantum field theory is that we have a field and excitations of the field that will give you particles. And that means that all the particles that we know are just excitations of fields. And so we can describe uh, the electrons, the photons, and uh, quarks, and so on in terms of, 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 of a quantized field. And uh, what we have learned from this is that there are two completely different kinds of particles. They are the bosons and fermions. In principle, in principle completely unrelated, and they have they behave very differently from each other. And the, the property that they have, the, the fermions have integer spin. Thin. And in, uh, in natural units, I mean, I'm setting h bar c 2 pi and all that equals to 1. <coughs> and fermions for which s is m plus a half. So again, where n is an integer. So we know that they behave completely different. We know that the bosons can be all together in, in a in one uh, state, and then that's where we can have things like uh, lasers and so on. But fermions, they, they obey the Pauli principle, so they cannot be all together in the same state. So you have to, that explains why we have the, all the whole structures of the, of the periodic table of elements and so on, because uh, the fermions behave, they cannot be two fermions in the same state. So, <clears throat> so they're completely different particles, and they come out 
as excitations of a particular field. So that's, a, that's the basic we have about uh, quantum field theory. And quantum field theory tells us not only how the particles are, but how they interact. <clears throat> now, as a basic, uh, well, an example of a quantum field theory which has been very successful is what we call the, the standard model. And the standard model um, describes, in, the, in terms of quantum fields, the three of the, of the four interactions that are known, describes um, <coughs> uh, a strong in electroweak interactions. And they are mediated by particles by particles of spin one. Which are uh, called the gluons, photons, Ws and Z. So that means that interactions are just one of these uh, type of particles, and the spin is one. <clears throat> then the matter fields and for they all have spin one half, and these are the quarks and leptons. So we know the mediators of the interactions are bosons, the motor fields are, are fermions, and they have spin one half. On top of that, it in principle has the Higgs particle that has not been discovered and is proposed to have spin zero. And in principle, the graviton if gravity will be a quantized theory for which you need a particle of spin two. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, this sounds a bit, uh, probably boring for you because probably you have heard it several times, but this has been one of the big triumphs of the 20th, 20th century, that we understand uh, physics at the fundamental level. Everything that we have been, every experiment that has been performed can be understood in terms of this standard model. So it's a great thing. And it's a big success for the high energy physics that we know uh, not only the fundamental particles, but the, also how they interact and uh, in terms of, of the simple rules using quantum field theory and the example of the standard model. Okay. Now, uh, to get there, this is just an example of a quantum field theory. There are many uh, quantum field theories. <coughs> Sorry? Sorry? Oh, okay. Good. Let me just take this. Okay. <coughs> there are many quantum field theories that uh, do not describe the standard model, but the standard model is a particular example that gives us what we want. Thank you. Okay, so what is it? Uh, so we have the basic theories, we have an example, and then what is it that guides us to to understand the, the 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 basic theories? Is what I call a basic tool. Or principle. And that is symmetry. Symmetry is, is essentially everything, or most of what we understand from, from uh, the basic uh, laws of nature come from symmetries. And let me tell you why. <clears throat> First of all, we have 
two kinds of symmetries, space-time symmetries, which include, uh, well, Lorenz or more generally Poincaré, and uh, all the way to general coordinate transformations in general relativity. So these are space-time symmetries. But we, we transform uh, the space-time coordinates. And, and uh, after that, we say that the laws of physics are invariant under these transformations. <clears throat> okay. And then there are also internal symmetries. Internal symmetries are symmetries that transform the fields in the quantum field theory. Sorry, as this means a general coordinate transformation. So someone, this is just the general relativity kind of transformations. Internal symmetries are those that where you, we transform the fields themselves without necessarily transforming the space and time. So, for instance, we, we can take uh, for the standard model. There is a particular symmetry that describes the standard model. Uh, standard model, the symmetry is G standard model is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. This SU3 is usually called SU3C by meaning color. This describes the strong interactions. SU2 is usually called L, and L is referred to something very important. L means left. Just to tell you that uh, there is a difference between left and right in the standard model, and that is something that you will have to keep that in mind. So parity is violated, essentially. So you have to have separated uh, if the symmetry acts on the le for the left or right-handed uh, fields. And this the SU2 cross U1, this is what describes the electroweak interactions. <clears throat> I, will, I will be more clear in a moment why these are attached to them. <clears throat> so, okay, so at least we have these two general classes of symmetries. And, uh, and, uh, and you can see the space-time symmetries are associated to changes of, uh, of, the, of space and time. And in particular, they are associated to the transformations that describe general relativity. That means intera uh, gravitational interactions. And the internal symmetries are transformations on the fields themselves, and they are responsible to describe the strong and electroweakest interactions. OK. Uh, <clears throat> why the symmetries are important? Symmetries are important <clears throat> for several reasons. One is, uh, is that they are used to classify the particles, so, or label. In the sense that you associate to the particle some labels to be classified. And uh, the labels are like uh, spin, for instance, or mass, mass, spin, but then also electric charge, color, and so on. Okay. So given a symmetry, you associate a number to the particle, and that's the kind of thing that describes the particle. It's a particle with a given charge, with a given spin, and so on, so they give it a name. This is, a, this is the, the electron. So, so, so the symmetries keep us a way to organize the, the particles in, in, and classify them. So th that, that is, is a very important role of the symmetries. But if it only were that, it would not be that important. One of the basic uh, reasons we know that the symmetries are so important is because the symmetries, they determine the interactions between the particles. Interactions. And, uh, 
And this is through what is called uh, the, what is called the gauge principle. Okay. And so I will be more explicit on this. The idea here I will illustrate with an example and the example is as follows take a, a Lagrangian to be d mu phi d mu phi star okay but that's the simple Lagrangian for phi, where phi is a scalar field, so that means it's been zero field that has no, no indices. And so we know that, uh, and oh, well, this Lagrangian can, can have a scalar potential that let's take it to be a function of the product of phi phi star. Okay. This Lagrangian, phi being a scalar field, uh, is invariant, that means it has a symmetry. Under the transformation, phi goes to e to the i alpha phi, where alpha is a phase. <clears throat> and alpha is a constant. Okay, so we do multiply e to the i alpha, since we have phi and phi star here, they cancel, and since you have here phi times phi star, it also cancels. So, so that means that, that, that you have, uh, you make this transformation. The field is a function of a space and time, but you're rotating at every point in space and time, and, and space and time by the same angle, so alpha. So this is called a global symmetry. Okay. So, but we can try to make this more general, and pr probably you have seen this uh, in in um, in, uh, in the symmetries and, part and groups uh, uh, course. Is that if uh, if uh, we want alpha to be a function of space and time, alpha of x, then there's no problem with the potential. The potential is a, is a polynomial, say, on phi phi star. It continues being invariant. It doesn't matter. But the kinetic term is no longer invariant. Okay? So, so we know that um, d mu phi, then it will go to what? It will go to e to the i alpha times d mu phi. <clears throat> plus i d mu alpha times phi. And then that this extra term makes the Lagrangian uh, non-invariant. But if we modify and, and, and have and define d mu phi with capital D, to be d mu phi plus i a mu phi, introducing this new field A. So this one will go to e to the i alpha times d mu phi will go to this, so it's d mu phi plus i d mu alpha phi plus the transformation of this term plus i a mu phi prime, where a mu prime means the transformation of a mu. And we can make 
this this will be equal can you see here yeah this will be equal to e to the i alpha d mu phi if a mu prime equals to a mu minus d mu alpha. So that means that, ki that kills that, this part. OK? So this very simple idea, this is what is called the, the gauge principle, in the sense that by introducing this new field, a mu, it makes the symmetry go from glo global to local. Now, if d mu phi transforms in this way, we can generate now, instead of writing a Lagrangian like d mu phi, d mu phi, we will write it in, in terms of this capital D. OK. But now, <clears throat> there is this new field. And then this new field, a mu, has an index, so it's a vector field. As a vector field, so it's spin one. And that, that induces a coupling between the, the fields phi's, because now in d mu phi, d mu phi, there is a coupling of a mu to phi, because here you will have, there will be a coupling a mu phi, a mu phi star. And this is a coupling of, of this field to that field, okay? In terms of, uh, of a diagram, you will have this kind of couplings. Okay. Okay. Similarly, for the Lagrange of uh, the Dirac field, We do the same trick for the Dirac field Lagrangian. Instead of having just partial derivative here, we have d mu. That will be the coupling of a fermion to a mu psi. And that will be the standard coupling of a fermion to, to To a gauge field, and then this will you will see, this will be the, this this uh, vertex here. You can have the same vertex there, and you can see here, for instance, psi psi going to psi psi. So this is an interaction between two fermions and going back to, to two fermions mediated by this a mu field, and that's why this a mu is the mediator of interactions, and that's why explains why I told you that the standard model symmetry is based, the standard model is based on the symmetry SU3, SU2, and U1. What is the symmetry? Is the symmetry that the, that the corresponding fermion fields have to have in order to induce this coupling to, to, to a new field, which is the gauge field, spin one, that mediates the interactions. Okay? So that's, what, that's uh, uh, the power of, 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 uh, of, of the symmetry. The symmetries mediate, are, are, are the reason why we understood the interactions, we understand the interactions, because uh, they gave us the prescription of how the fields couple. So now, you, now we know how the electrons couple to an electromagnetic field, for instance, <coughs> in a well-defined matter. OK. Another properties of, property of symmetry that is very important is that symmetries can hide. And this is um, as a third of that three lines, level particles determine interactions, and then the symmetries can hide, and they hide in the following way. Take again the same Lagrangian, so we can have 
uh, v to be a potential, so let's consider if uh, v is a potential like this. You can see the symmetries on the rotation. Rotation is, is phi multi being multiplied by a phase is a symmetry on the distorted rotation. So this is a symmetric. On the, uh, say, phi goes to e to i alpha phi, where phi is the, this is the potential here. And this is, a, I don't know, real phi and imaginary phi. <coughs> So here we have a potential. Whenever we have a potential energy, we, have, we live in the vacuum. That means in the state of minimum energy. We have this potential. That means that at the end, whatever, whatever happens, the vacuum will be this point, the point with minimum energy. And this point has, shares the same symmetry as the potential. So the minimum, so the Or of vacuum is such that in this case phi equal to zero is also symmetric. So in this case the symmetry is manifest. However, but if the potential is of this type, I'm not a good drawer, but I, you can see the, the, the yeah, this, this double. In this case, you have the same symmetry. The, 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 the potential is symmetric under this, but the minimum is at the point phi different from zero, because the minimum now the, po the symmetric point was zero, was, is zero. It's, a, it's actually not a minimum, but it's a maximum. But the minimum is this point, but this point is any point on this circle. It's a minimum. So it's not invariant. It's not invariant under this phase rotation. This is a very simple idea. But the fact that the f minimum is different from zero tells you that we may, if we live or in the configuration of, of, of the minimum here, it can be any point on this. So we, we will not see the symmetry at all, because we make a transformation, we move to another minimum, and make the transformation, go to another minimum, and so on. So the symmetry is hidden here. And this is what is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's actually not broken, but it's actually hidden. It says that if we are sitting at the, at, at the, at the point of minimum energy, we will not see the symmetry. This is very, very important, because that tells us that then the real symmetries of nature can be many, uh, many much, much more bigger than we could imagine, because it may be many other symmetries, but we live in a state that breaks that symmetry. Okay. Okay. So, so this is what is called spontaneous symmetry breaking, and this is precisely what happens in the standard model. And the standard model, the symmetry, the SU2 in, in, in the standard model, the symmetry SU2 cross U1 actually gets broken to just, just U1. And this gets broken by an expectation value of a corresponding field, which is called the Higgs field, of order 10 to the 2 GeV. And that's what people say that this symmetry is broken at the scale 10 to the 2 GeV 
to U1, and this U1 is U1 electromagnetism. So that's why we only see electromagnetic uh, uh, symmetry and, and the, the symmetry of the, uh, electro -weak, uh, the, the weak interactions were hidden inside the SU2 cross U1. Okay? So that's another lesson we learned from symmetries. So the symmetries can hide from us, but if we are clever enough, we can discover them by using the, the good theory. And that's a, that's a big lesson that experience have taught us. So that if we want to look for the basic symmetries of nature, we don't have to only see the ones that are manifest, but we have to look for the symmetries that can be hidden. OK. So <clears throat> this is uh, the, the idea of what I wanted to tell you about the uh, symmetries and why the symmetries have been basic into building the standard model. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. This uh, ideas you will see in the course of the standard model course that I recommended very much to you. I, every year I say the same thing. The most important course you should take this term is not this one, unfortunately. It's the standard model because that's the one that we know is correct. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay. all the ones that we are the thing that we are, I will tell you today and the next and the rest of the course is beautiful and everything, but uh, it may be, it may have nothing to do with nature, unfortunately. So we have to accept that. We hope not, but that's why we are working on that. But uh, this may be a possibility, but the standard model is something you all should know. Okay. <clears throat> so, but the standard model, if it were everything uh, right, so it would be kind of boring because everything has been already done. But, uh, Fortunately for us, the, pro the standard model has many problems. Okay. Okay. And the most important one, probably you have heard this many times, but we should address it and mention it every time we can, because this is the most important problem in theoretical physics. It's uh, at all of that, as I told you, describe the, all the interactions, electromagnetic, weak, and strong interactions in the quantum level, in the sense that we have this well-defined picture of, of, a, of, a, of a gauge symmetry. And that's, those Lagrangians can be quantized very well. But gravity is treated completely different, and gravity is only treated at the classical level. So the problem of describing gravity at the quantum level is the most important conceptual problem that we have. <clears throat> Another problem is uh, is the, the many why questions. There are many why questions that on the standard model that we don't know. For instance, why <clears throat> there are only why the, the, the group of the standard model is this. It could be anything else. It can be SU2000 or E8 or something, but it just happened to be this, this group. So this, you have to understand why that would be the case. And that, that's a way of saying why there are only uh, four interactions. Right? Because this will tell you that each group, uh, uh, each factor is telling you different interactions. So we, at least we have why is it that there are strong and electronic interactions and nothing else? Why well, there are only, the, except from gravity, only four interactions in total? <clears throat> why there are only why there are three families of quarks and leptons. These particles, as I told you, they are the basic structures of, of matter, uh, the basic components of matter, and they come in three identical copies. We are made out of one, but there are other two that we don't know what they are there. So these are called the families, and there are three families, and why there are three and not one, or not many more, so that's open questions. <clears throat> why, important for us, why is it that we live in 3 plus 1 dimensions? All this is formulated, assuming that we live in, in, in 3 dimensions, and this is the only thing that we experience, but we don't have an explanation for. And uh, there are also many other things, like there are 20 parameters, or 4 or 20 free parameters. 
that we don't know. They have, to, they have to be put in by hand. In the standard model, we don't know why they take those values. So the, ideally, we'd like to explain why they take those values. OK, so there are many questions that we don't understand for the standard model. Then there are these two questions which I consider very, very important. And these are called the hierarchies. There are two hierarchy questions that uh, are, are very, very, very important. And you will see why. And uh, I will mention this two. There are many small details, but the two which are important, more important are one is what is usually called the hierarchy problem. And the idea is, this, is the following. I told you over there that the scale of the standard model is this 10 to the 2 GeV. It's at that scale is where the symmetry is broken. Okay. So the, the scale of the standard model is a mass scale, electroweak. It's 10 to the 2 GeV. But we have, on the other hand, another fundamental scale, which is the Planck scale. And Planck. Does anybody know what is the value of M Planck in GeVs? No? A guess? Wild guess? 10 to the 19. 10 to the 19. Very good. <laughs> and you know the M Planck, you know what, what M Planck is? It's the, it's the constant, it's the mass dimension that you can make out of H, C, and the Newton's constant. It's essentially 1 over the square root of the Newton's constant. So that's why it defines gravity. Okay. So you can see these numbers 10 to the 2, this is 10 to the 19. And you can play with 10 to the 2 plus 1 and 10 to the 19. You can actually make it 10 to the 18 because there are factors of pi's and so on. So at the end, M, M electroweak or M Planck There are at least 15 orders of magnitude between the two. So, I mean, just, this can make two. If it is three and this is 18, that will be 18 minus three. Okay. So this is very, 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 very small. It's a very, very small number. And the question is, why this number is so small? Okay. So if, if there are two scales in nature, why they are so different? Okay. So this is the standard hierarchy problem. Exactly. Because the electron mass is much lower than Planck mass. It's, it's that the natural electroweak scale should be at the scale of mass. Yes, very, very good question. Yes, very good question. Yes. So it's not only an issue. That, well, the electron mass, in principle, is, is, this, that's the, this, those are the other hierarchies that I was referring to. There is, because you have to re refer the electron mass compared to the electroweak. Because the electroweak mass scale is the thing that generates the masses to all the particles. So why the electron is a little bit smaller than that? So that's, 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 a, a, that's another hierarchy problem. But, but this is the, the, you said, the two fundamental scales, this one and that one, and they're completely different. And the issue that makes this problem so important is, is that imagine that you just tune by hand, I put by hand, say, well, I have this scale and that other scale, and that's it. But when I do qu quantum corrections in, in my, my theory, this, uh, this scale, there's nothing to avoid to be, run, to, to be brought to as high as possible, as high as where your theory is valid. So you assume that you have, you see the effective, the standard model as your effective theory descri describing physics at scales 10 to the 2 GeV, but higher also. You just assume that the standard model is true to all the scales, all the way to the Planck scale, where you, when you get to the Planck scale, you don't know what is going on because it's, it's, a, it's where gravity is important. But you assume that it's valid all the way just before that. The natural value that uh, this scale will take is as high as you can go. Is, is, go, is, is close to the, stand, to the Planck scale. Otherwise, you have to do tuning order by order in perturbation theory in your calculations in, 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 in your Feynman diagrams. Order by order, you have to tune that. And then that will be a completely unnatural thing. You have to tune things to many, many, or many dec uh, decimal figures. And that is the real importance of the hierarchy problem. It's, it's, it's not only that you can they have these two different values, but it's also that, that uh, you assume the standard model is valid to higher energies. This scale, or that means, uh, is in physical terms, is given by the, by the mass of the Higgs field, it wants to be as high as possible. It wants to be as high as, this, as, as, as a Planck mass. And we know it's not like that. So that's something that has to be explained. 
And I emphasize this problem because this is precisely the main reason we study, we consider supersymmetry may be an important uh, point to solve this question. So uh, I, I, will, I will insist on this question during my lecture course. So that's one question. The other question. The other hierarchy question is probably even more more difficult. So I have a MW. The other one is a, is that there is now uh, evidence that the, our universe is accelerating, and that that in, can be explained by the fact that. Uh, that there is a, a vacuum energy, at least, different from zero. So the, the, you have a minimum of a potential with gravity. The minimum is not at zero, but it's, the energy is, is, is a bit above zero. How, how much above zero it is, is extremely small. So this is what is called the cosmological constant problem. The idea is that, is that uh, you may have heard that this story of uh, Einstein says the biggest blunder of my life, uh, this saying that he introduced this constant to, to solve some, qu some problems about uh, his original um, uh, equations, the Einstein's equations, and then he, uh, to describe that the universe was uh, static, but then people discovered that the universe was accelerating, and then he took off that uh, constant and said, well, it was a blunder to have introduced it. I, 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 with our standards now, I think the blunder was for him to believe that he had the right to put it or take it back. <laughs> so he was wrong not uh, to take it back also, to take it out of it. Because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something, taking it out from your equations, that means that you're assuming that it's zero, and you have to explain why it's zero. So, so we have better standards now than Einstein used to have. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so the cosmological constant problem is, is the energy of the vacuum. It's almost zero. How close to zero it is? is 10 to the minus 120 and Planck to the 4. You, talk, you, you, know, you have a potential of units of uh, mass to the 4, so this is 10 to the minus 120 and Planck to the 4. Uh, so that, uh, and, and that's what is called uh, lambda, the cosmological constant. Uh, but you can define a mass scale for lambda and then divide that by m electroweak, and that is also a order 10 to the minus 15, if you take that. So you see this interesting that the, the two problems are more or less the same. That are the, at least three, these three scales, the scale associated to the cosmological constant is the ratio to that to the electroweak is the same as the electroweak to the Planck scale, and they are of order 10 to the minus 15, and again, this is very, very, very small. And uh, again, quantum corrections will tend to make a, a lambda to be uh, at any value different from zero, so you have to adjust. And this is the, the, the worst case of fine tuning in the history of, uh, of science, and that's why we are happy to know that there are open questions, questions so all you young generation can solve. So <clears throat> this is very good. Okay, so what, what can we guide us? Can this, uh, give me three more minutes just to. Uh, uh, so what can we do to go beyond the standard model? So that means that we have to go beyond the standard model. Because we know the standard model is not the full story. And so one thing is that we can have experimental guidance. But uh, up to now, we don't have that much from that because everything fits with the standard model. We hope next year they will turn on LHC and that will be a dream that uh, they will discover many new things at the moment. We don't have that factor to play with. So the, actually, the, the following what our experience has shown us to, to be successful is that we can have more symmetries. And more symmetries mean two possibilities. It's uh, internal. Internal means that you can have a group that gets broken at the high scale to the standard model gauge group, and this one gets broken to ratio 3 cross U1. 
at 10 to the 2 GeV, and this may be at a scale, say, 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 17 GeV. And this is what is called Grand Unified Theories, or GOTS. Uh, <clears throat> it has a nice prediction that if this group is a, is a simple group, then you can have that the, the running of the Coplin's constant, the Coplin's constant scale with energy, and we know them at uh, our scale to be different. So we can say, oh, this is electroweak, they're weak, and the strong is very strong, but they, they change with the energy such that the idea will be that they will, at a high energy, so the 10 to the, 10, 10 to the 16 or 17, they can get unified in one single theory. Unfortunately, the experiments show that this, this doesn't happen. The way that we know it's running, they will not meet at the point. The other way to go is to generalize by space-time symmetries. How can we have bigger space-time symmetries? We have explored all the symmetries we know. So space-time symmetries, we have two possibilities. One is more dimensions. So if we live in five dimensions or six or ten, we have more space-time symmetries. Okay? So that's one of the motivations for this course. And the other space-time symmetry that uh, can be used is supersymmetry. Okay. So supersymmetry is usually confused with an internal symmetry because what it actually does is just exchange bosons and fermions. And that's a, that's a very, 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 very rare of a symmetry exchange in those two kinds of particles. But actually, it's a, you will see in this course that it's a space-time symmetry. So by following our, uh, the things that have been successful for us, that means that the, the, to go beyond the standard model, the natural thing to do is to go look for bigger symmetries. And the bigger symmetries are supersymmetry and extra dimensions. Okay? And that's motivates this course. By the way, if you combine supersymmetry with GOTS, then this unification actually works. So that's another motivation for supersymmetry. And also, supersymmetry provides the, the, good, the best candidate say, for dark matter, which is also another motivation. Uh, just uh, to finish, there is another step. So more experiment, more symmetries also go beyond QFT. And you want to go beyond QFT, what is it that you do? String theory. It's beyond Pontiful theory. And what do you need for a string theory to be consistent? Supersymmetry again. Okay, so that's another motivation to use. So it needs supersymmetry. Okay, so at least this will give you motivation why we think supersymmetry is so important. It's important at low energies. It will solve the hierarchy problem if, we, if it could. It also is a natural thing to do to go beyond our standard principles to look, look for uh, bigger symmetries, but also is the thing that superstring theory needs to be consistent. So I think we'll stop today here and uh, continue on Monday.